introduction and everything. And welcome to today's Ask Mr. Senate for the My name is Jesse Miller, and I'm one of the organizers, along with Ann Lee, uh, Constantine, and Harris Bronson, on uh, Ask and Work on the Play of Fundamental Physics and Machine Learning. And today's talk by Fiala Shanahan is very much in the spirit of this workshop. Fiala Mike. in the MIT Center for Theoretical Physics. And as of yesterday, she's now an associate professor uh, of physics at MIT. Well, for the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which is an NSF funded uh, uh, AI research institute, trying to develop this uh, field of rapid issue of AI, which is something that you're going to be hearing about in this colloquium today. Uh, in Fiala's case, what she's doing is taking first principles calculations in quantum chromodynamics, which describes the strong nuclear force, and using the tool of lattice field theory to inter interrogate this model. And lattice field theory is an, era, uh, an area where conceptual, computational, and algorithmic insights are really having a transformative impact. And Fiala is at the forefront of accelerating these lattice gauge theory calculations uh, by using machine learning, but also maintaining certain theoretical guarantees, which is going to be explaining to you in the talk today. So Fiala has many awards. Let me just mention one, the Maria uh, Gerbert Mayer Award from the American Physical Society for producing key insights into the structure and interactions of hadrons and nuclei. And today she's going to tell us more about some of those insights that she's had through the lens of machine learning. So join me in welcoming Fiala. Thank you. Hey. Thank you very much, Jesse. Can someone clear that because that's not on my screen. Okay, we're in business. Thank you very much, Jesse. Okay, um, so as Jesse said, attending the workshop on the interplay of machine learning and fundamental physics, so I've tried to really tune this colloquium sort of on, on those themes. But really, the topic of this talk is at a heart structure of matter. Right? And of course, we know um, that atoms have densely packed nuclear cores of protons and neutrons orbited by a cloud of electrons. We also know that in our current best understanding of the structure of matter, that structure goes one layer deeper and that the protons and neutrons themselves have a substructure. They're made of more fundamental particles called quarks, held bound or glued tightly together by these, by these yellow springs. Those are the gluons, the force carriers of the strong force. The quarks and the gluons and their interactions are encoded in the standard model of nuclear and particle physics. And so this model has just 17 fundamental particles. We see them here on the slide. We have the matter particles, the quarks, which come in different types of flavors. We have the electron and its neutrino and their heavier cousins. We have the Higgs boson. And we have force carriers for three of the four fundamental forces in nature, so notably excluding gravity. Everything else comes together in this very beautiful, very symmetric, very predictive framework put together in the 1970s. Um, and in fact, it's so symmetric and predictive that a number of these particles were predicted from the symmetries of the theory before they were seen experimentally. Um, so the, the top quark in 1995, the tau neutrino in 2000, and then I think we might all remember the Higgs boson in 2012. was the last piece of this puzzle found at the Large Hadron Collider experiment. Okay, so this is our framework, and it really is the, the most successful physics theory we've ever had. And, and just for a taste of how extraordinarily successful this theory is, here's just one example. So this is the magnetic moment of the electron. That's how much torque an electron feels in a magnetic field. This is the most accurately verified prediction in the history of physics. Um, so here we see the theory result, the experimental result. Anyone who studied quantum field theory, you have an idea of the immensity of this theory result. It's 30 years of effort, um, Feynman diagrams, over 30,000 Feynman diagrams, up to five loops to get this beautiful agreement at 12 significant degrees. So beautiful agreement between theory and experiment. And of course, it's not just that. It's not just simple static quantities. It's beautiful agreement over an incredibly wide range of energy scales. But here's just one more example. Here we're looking at deep inelastic scattering. So fire an electron at a proton so hard it breaks apart. We can encode that process in these things here called structure functions. 
On the horizontal axis, we have the energy scale. Here we have a log scale, so five orders of magnitude in energy. We have theory here in the yellow bands and experiments giving us all these colored points here. You see this beautiful agreement across all the energy scales. So beautifully successful theory. Of course, we also know that the standard model is beautifully predictive and successful, but it does not describe everything we observe about the universe. So just one example that I'll come back to in a little bit is of course dark matter isn't included at all. The standard model describes only this little 5% sliver the energy density pi of the universe. Half time does much as dark matter, doesn't emit or absorb light, but interacts gravitationally. That's how we know it's there, not described by the standard model. Even more is dark energy, which is whatever's driving the accelerating expansion of the universe. Right? But the standard model doesn't tell us anything about that. And it's not just dark matter and dark energy. Neutrinos have masses in nature. But we, we know that because we, we see them oscillate experimentally, they, they, they don't the minimal standard model. Um, there's a matter-antimatter asymmetry. You know, universes are made of matter, not antimatter, and that asymmetry is greater than we can explain from standard model interactions alone. Gravity is not part of the standard model. There are questions of naturalness. Why is there such a discrepancy between the weak and the gravitational scales, and so on, right? So, of course, one of the great efforts we make as a community is to find and constrain the physics beyond the standard model that's not described our fundamental theory. Um, and just one of the large number of ways we do this is through experiments at what's called the intensity frontier. This is where we have very precise experiments looking to reveal very, very small deviations between what we predict and what we measure. So this class of studies includes everything from magnetic moments. So we just saw the magnetic moment of the electron as the most accurately verified prediction in the history of physics. Or well, the muon, so the electron's heavier cousin, is a really interesting tension at the moment between the theory predictions here and the best experimental value. It's a level of, say, four standard deviations. Um, dark matter direct detection falls into this category. So experiments where we're looking for the potentially very weak interactions of dark matter directly with our terrestrial detectors. Many neutrino physics experiments fall into this category and so on. What all of these experiments have in common is, of course, that you need to know something about the standard model physics of the protons or nuclei. Either you need the standard model prediction for G minus two to compare to experiment. You need to know the standard model physics of the nuclei in your dark matter detector to disentangle what are nuclear effects and what's dark matter. And, and so this is really what motivates study, the, the first principles study of the structure of protons, neutrons, and nuclei directly from our fundamental theory, of the standard model. It's really, firstly, for its own sake, can we really understand from this Beautifully simple, in some sense, fundamental theory, all of the complexities of nature emerge. Can we see how nuclear reactions come from the standard model? We see the emergence of that complexity. Secondly, we, we need to understand that structure from first principles to have backgrounds and benchmarks for our searches for the new physics that we know exists beyond the standard model. So that's the motivation and the framework. And so in this talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a hint about how first principles calculations are revealing these areas. But I, I really want to focus just because of the theme of the workshop here that I'm attending, and how advances in computing and algorithms are changing this landscape. OK, so to talk about first principles studies of the standard model is really to talk about QCD or the theory of the strong interactions in the standard model. Um, so QCD. Uh, describes the strongest of the four forces in nature. So the strong interactions bind quarks and gluons into protons and neutrons and bind protons and neutrons into nuclei. So if we're trying to study the structure of those protons, neutrons, and nuclei, of course, the strong interactions are going to play a large role. But the strong interactions are also pretty difficult to study from first principles just because the theory is non-perturbative. So what that means, here's the coupling or the interaction strength of the theory. Is the energy scale. If we move to the right, so the high energies, coupling or the interaction strength is small. So of course, if you have a small parameter, you can expand in powers of the parameter in a perturbative expansion. You know that the next order will be smaller still. So, you know, squaring a small number makes it smaller. Then you can stop at some order. If we move to the left and even further to the left than what's shown on this plot, the coupling becomes large. You can't do a perturbative expansion. And what you're left with is numerical methods if you want first principles calculations. That what brings us to this particular 
first principles approach. This is the only known systematically improvable approach to studying strong interactions in this non-perturbative regime called lattice QCD or lattice field theory. And it is really exactly what it sounds like. You take your theory, you discretize it onto a four-dimensional space-time lattice or grid uh, in such a way that you can solve the theory numerically, right? So what this then looks like QCD equations. So, so this is the, the quantum field theory. ends up looking like integrals for all of the degrees of freedom, which looks like integrals over your a very high dimensional discretized space, essentially. Um, these integrals are really, really high dimensional. So in state of the art calculations, it's something like 10 to the nine to 10 to the 12 variables. You're essentially just doing a numerical integration over to compute expectation value of some observable you care about in the theory. Of course, when you're in such a high dimensional space, you can't just do you know, naive Monte Carlo sampling. You have to do important sampling. And that of course just means that you know some contributions are more important than others. And we can think of this just from quantum mechanics. We know that the paths near the classical path dominate and others are correspondingly less important. It's the same in field theory. So we just sample more important contributions correspondingly more and the less important contributions correspondingly less to have an efficient way of doing the high dimensional integrals. So just because we will go into a little bit more detail, here the same thing is written just you know formally put our theory onto this it should really be four dimensional even though i can only draw three so this four dimensional space-time grid or lattice of course as soon as you discretize your theory you have to take the limit as the spacing becomes small and as the volume becomes large you cover your continuum infinite volume theory um sometimes we use larger than physical values of the quark masses and you'll see an example and typically that is just for reasons of computational expediency because the calculations are cheaper and if you're really pushing the boundaries of what's possible numerically, you make it a bit easier and you try to extrapolate down rather than computing directly, at the end, right? And then this is precisely what I said in words before. You wanna compute the expectation value of some observable. This is something physical we wanna measure. That looks like integrals here over quark fields and gluon fields is our observable. And it's weighted here by the exponential of the action. And the action is just a function describing the quark and gluon dynamics of QCD. If we sample contributions to this integral with this weighting, the exponential of the action already built in, everything just becomes taking means and standard deviations over um, the observables computed on each of those samples. Right? So just a, a Monte Carlo approach. And that's essentially the idea. Um, one thing that's really important to emphasize here is that we've discretized our theory and this discretized theory has the same free parameters as the theory of QCD itself. That's the masses of the quarks, the fundamental particles, and the coupling constant, which is related to the lattice spacing. And so once you've fixed those parameters, of course, you have to fix them by matching to experiment in some way, and matching to some number of measured quantities, like the masses of some fundamental particles. Everything else you compute, from intricate details of the proton's internal dynamics, the nuclear reaction rates, everything else is a prediction of the theory. There is no sense in which you're saying, you know, modeling a proton being three quarks. There is no sense in which you're modeling a nucleus as being made of protons and neutrons. It just really comes out of what are the quantum numbers of the state and the dynamics of QCD. And that's it. Okay, so I, I mentioned that these are extremely high dimensional integrals. So they're also extremely computationally expensive. Um, so I'll show you just a couple of, of calculations sort of as a teaser before we talk about numerical methods. Um, and they would have taken something like 250,000 years on this laptop. Um, so, of course, we don't use laptops, but we use the largest supercomputers we have access to. This is Frontier. It is just in the commissioning phase in the US. This is going to be our first exascale machine. This is Fugaku in Japan, the previous largest supercomputer in the world. Um, and of course, we use significant amounts of time on, the, on these resources. And also, it works, right? So this is extremely computationally demanding. We use years of supercomputer time. And out of all of that, you get actually systematically improvable, um, precise, controlled results. And it's really only in the last decade that we've reached this level of precision and control in, in, in these numerical methods. So here are just a couple of examples. So this is the proton neutron mass difference. And so this is a computation from 2015, sort of the start of this real era of precision and control in these methods. Of course, we know the proton neutron mass difference from experiment, right? That's this yellow band here. What you get from theory is well, first, you can reproduce that very small 
mass difference that's of course so important for life on earth if, if 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 the proton was heavier than the neutron then the nucleus of the hydrogen atom could decay stars wouldn't live long after they form and so on right we can reproduce the total but more interestingly we can really understand how it arises from our fundamental theory we can see how the strong interactions push the mass difference one way electromagnetic interactions push it the other way a delicate cancellation that reproduces exactly what we measure it, right right so there's a, a great complementarity between theory and experiment when we have this level of precision and control. Here's another example of that complementarity. So what this figure is showing is a spectrum of masses of heavy baryons, that's particles like the proton, but we're with some, some heavier quarks in them. And all of these blue points here are our lattice QCD calculations. The red bands are experiment, except for this one here. So that was in fact a prediction from the lattice QCD calculation and the LHCB experiment could go and look where that state was predicted and find that state. So we have controlled predictive calculations. And as I said, we're in a, an era of precision and control for single hadron quantities, especially the simple ones. But we're also at the very cusp of an era of being able to do true first principle studies for nuclear physics, which is something um, I'm very interested in. And, and so here's one example. Um, of course, in the first you know, seconds after the Big Bang, we, we had the um, Big Bang nucleosynthesis pathway, starting with NP to D gamma interaction is the very first step of that pathway. Um, so this is really one of the first processes to show that photo nuclear reactions are different from the photon interacting with the protons and neutrons in the nucleus itself. So nuclear effects and photonuclear interactions. We're able to really see that from first principles calculation. So this is two body contribution really this difference between the photon hitting the individual proton and neutron and, and hitting the nucleus itself, this NP to D gamma reaction. Um, this is the pi on mass, as I said, when we're really pushing what's possible computationally, we can't necessarily do the calculation here at the physical pi on mass, we do it at heavier masses and extrapolate down. And the red star is the experimentally known um, uh, value for this particular process. And you can see where we have, you know, a far extrapolation, fairly noisy butter here, but, first results for really first principles nuclear physics from this approach, um, which is rapidly developing. Okay, we'll see a little bit more first principles nuclear physics. The main example I wanna give is really in this category of backgrounds and benchmarks for searches for new physics. And I wanna to come to a problem, which is of course, one of the great mysteries of our time. It's, it's what is dark matter. And of course there is really abundant evidence for dark matter, everything from galactic rotation curves, lensing, structure formation. We have beautiful pictures like this horse color picture of the bullet cluster. We have a, a separation between the, the luminous matter, the matter that we can see from, from the stars in, in pink here, and the matter that we can infer is there gravitationally, this sort of bluey, purpley color. And we understand that as coming from clusters of galaxies colliding and, and the normal matter sort of crashing into itself and the dark matter passing through, giving us this beautiful separation. We have all of these pieces of gravitational evidence and we have all of these many, many theories for what dark matter could possibly be. Right? Um, and I know there are people here who work on phenomenology, you know, ideas of dark matter, everything from neutrinos, sterile neutrinos, axions, extra Higgs, extra dimensions, and so on. Right? And so the big question is, can we constrain this space? All of the possible theory explanations for dark matter, rule out some explanations, support others, and, and that's the goal. So just one of the many, many ways we can, of course, try to constrain this space through direct detection experiments. So that is where we look you know, for direct interactions of dark matter with some detector here on Earth. The one class of dark matter we can look for this way is WIMPs, which weakly interacting massive particles, which might interact through the weak interactions with standard model matter, so the particles we can build in detectors out of. And then of course, if you see something, also if you don't and you wanna place a limit, the detection rate depends on the properties of the dark matter, which is the thing you wanna constrain, and also the probability that your dark matter will interact with the nuclei that you build your detector out of. And so we have these two components to disentangle what not seeing dark matter in the detector means for the properties of dark matter. So what the limits on these sorts of direct detection experiments look like is this. So this is the mass of our dark matter particle or our WIMP. Here we have the SI just means spin independent interaction of our dark matter particle, with a proton or neutron, so a nucleon. Each experiment gets a line here. These are exclusions because we haven't seen dark matter here. They're excluding 
all of the space above each line. Okay. So the key feature of this plot that I want to point out is what's highlighted here in yellow. That this is giving us the interaction cross section between dark matter and a proton or neutron. Experiments, however, have detectors built out of, in many cases, very large nuclei, like these ones here. These use xenon. It's a very large nucleus, right? So there's been implicitly a translation between not seeing dark matter hit xenon and what that means for the interaction strength of dark matter with a single proton or neutron. Okay, so the simplest approach to translating from not seeing dark matter hit xenon to what it means for the properties of dark matter in terms of its interactions with protons and neutrons just to use the Born approximation. Let's just scale by the numbers of protons and neutrons. That's here. So if you can compute, and I said we're in this, we're in a real precision era for lattice QCD calculations of single proton properties. Whatever your model of dark matter, I can compute for you precisely the interaction strength with a single proton or neutron. And you say, well, to get the, the, the interaction with xenon, let's multiply by the number of protons and neutrons, which is A. And simplest translation we can make. However, what if there's nuclear physics? What if you have not just this term, say non-trivial interactions of the dark matter here with multiple protons or neutrons at a time? Um, and, and this we can compute precisely. This here is, is, is not known. And from recent calculations, we have some hints that this might be much bigger than was previously expected. So I'll just show you those hints here. So what I'm showing here are scalar matrix elements. And the reason I care about scalar matrix elements is even though I don't know anything about the, the microscopic structure of dark matter, the generic low energy limit of a spin in, in the interaction is scalar. These cross sections are governed by what we call the scalar matrix element. Okay. Now, we can't measure scalar matrix elements for different nuclei experimentally. We can measure something different. We can measure weak interaction matrix elements. So let's look at those first. We can measure them in different nuclei. We can also compute them in very light nuclei. And what we compute from lattice QCD is here. This is a you know, fraction of a percent effect. This is just the nuclear effect, so the difference from the Born approximation in a light nucleus helium-3. It's not a physical calculation, so you have to extrapolate and you get here, percent effect, which matches perfectly with what you get from experiment. Experiment, you can also measure this effect in much larger nuclei. You get tens of percent effect. Okay, now for the scalar matrix elements, which is what we really care about here, calculation starts at tens of percent effect in this unphysical calculation. Okay, that doesn't tell us how to translate from, from not seeing dark matter hit xenon to what that means for proton and neutron, but it tells us that there's what is the magnitude difference here? And this was not previously known. Mm -hmm. What about extrapolating to the physical masses and what about large nuclei like xenon? And so this is a, a question that we would really like to answer, right? So why is this so hard? Why can't I just say, oh, look, we did a calculation in Xenon directly from these principles. Here's the answer. It's really because of computational cost, right? We have compounding factorial and exponential growths in computational cost. When we try to study larger and larger nuclei from this method. Just to give you a sort of intuition for why. So we're doing this sampling approach. It's Monte Carlo sampling of, of integrals. And the statistical uncertainty grows exponentially with the number of protons and neutrons. So you need to take exponentially more samples to get a result with the same precision. It's not just that. The amount of work you have to do on each sample, the complexity of the calculation grows factorially. And that comes from hooking up all the different quarks with each other. That's a factorial problem, right? So these things compound, make it really, even though we're in a precision era for calculation of the proton, we're only just being able to do first calculations of nuclei with atomic number, that's number of protons and neutrons less than about five. And because this is a compounding factorial and exponential, even just going, you know, five to six is a really big jump in computational cost. So you know, we're not going to get to xenon, right? Um, but what we can do is we can, if we can do precise controlled calculations of light nuclei, you know, up to five, up to 10 maybe, then we have a path forward. Then we can match on nuclear effective theory. And so that is, we do know that you know, nuclear shell models are pretty good descriptors of, of nuclear physics, right? I said that seeing tens of percent effects in the two-body interaction was unexpectedly large for the scalar matrix elements, but still tens of percent, right? So there is a hierarchy here. We do know one-body currents are dominant, two-body currents are subleading, but potentially very important three body are subleading again, and, and so on. And so if we can get controlled calculations of the lightest nuclei going up and up and up, we can match onto nuclear many body methods and effective field theories 
reach larger nuclei. So that sort of pipeline of these calculations, um, and, and these pipelines can reproduce the actual matrix elements for large nuclei that, that we saw measured before for large nuclei like 10. And so this is the path forward but to really exploit this, to really sort of move nuclear physics into this first principles era of matching on to direct first principles calculations and extrapolating up, um, we need better systematic control than we've got. And what's limiting that is computation. So this, of course, you know, not just dark matter direct detection, that's just the example I'm using here, but all across nuclear physics um, that we would impact if we could have controlled first principles calculations of nuclei. So the example here is would really like scalar matrix elements in xenon. It's A equals 131, that's pretty big. Um, but also going to slightly smaller nuclei. It will be to decay. We heard about that this morning in the machine learning talk. So I put this in. Um, uh, the lightest nucleus that undergoes double beta decay is calcium. That's A equals 48. That's still a lot bigger than five, right? And we would like to have impact on neutrino physics experiments. So June, um, big, you know, flagship neutrino physics experiment looking to measure the neutrino mass hierarchy and the mixing parameters and neutrino scattering from argon. Argon's A equals 40. And to work backwards from what you see in the detector to the constraints on neutrino properties, you really need some input from theory, and that's the actual form factors of argon. Right? We'd like to constrain all of these things from first principles and coming back to you know, of the, the, the questions I'd really like to answer, we'd like to really see how we get nuclear physics and how finely tuned it is out of the standard model. All of this, we need better control. So that's really what motivates trying to get improved algorithms. And especially if we have exponentially harder problems, we'd really like exponentially improved algorithms, ideally. Okay, so advances in computing and algorithms. To set the stage again, this principal study of the standard model of nuclear and particle physics I didn't have time to tell you about all of the many, you know, really precise calculations. I told you much more about the calculations that aren't quite at the level of precision we'd like to motivate this question. Um, but they all demand extreme scale computation. And so, of course, you know, AI and machine learning are having significant impact across physics. You say, oh, can we accelerate them using AI or ML? Of course, this here is the really important question there, We're doing first principles theory calculations. We can't compromise that in any way. We can't introduce you know, uncertainties, any sort of estimations. We really need calculations that we have guarantees of exactness and systematic control for. And again, the sort of big example, the big impact um, that I'm pitching here in this talk is if you just try to do it naively, there is not enough supercomputing in the world to do that calculation of the scalar matrix elements to Xenon. We'd like to, so we need better algorithms. Yeah. So I, I really emphasized this in a short talk I gave in our workshop, but I think it's worth repeating again and again and again. We're trying to do this principles theory calculations. The only thing machine learning can do for you is to help you do it faster. Yeah. The, the end result is maybe you're computing an integral. Integral has a value and you need to get that precise value. You can't go somewhere else with machine learning. Machine learning can just help you make it faster. And since we're doing first principles theory, we need to set up a situation like this. We have to put machine learning into our algorithms in a place where if it's bad, the results are still right. If it's good, the results are right. But ideally, if it's good, your results are right faster, right? So you need to set up a, a way where your, your algorithm is self-correcting for any sort of uncertainties in the machine learning. That's what guarantees of exactness means here. And I'll give you just one example of how we can set up and frame a problem to achieve this with machine learning. Okay, so to give you this example, we need to go into just a little bit of detail on these lattice field theory calculations. So we'll try to abstract away some of the details we don't want, but just, just to set up the problem, um, the very first stage of any of these calculations, no matter what you want to calculate, is to generate this set of samples, set of background quark and gluon field configurations that, that's giving you your, your Monte Carlo integral. So need to do important sampling. So we have to generate these samples here with a known probability distribution given by the exponential of the action. The action is the QCD action, it's the function describing the quark and gluon dynamic. Okay, so what do these samples really look like? What is this sampling problem? What they look like is these four dimensional space-time grids where on each edge here or on each link of the lattice or grid, we have a matrix. It's an SU3 matrix. So that's a three by three matrix with unit determinant. And, and you have a very large number of these matrices so that you have something like 10 to the 12 double precision numbers in total defining one sample. 
So again, one sample is a matrix on every edge of this four-dimensional grid. Okay. And then we need to generate these samples of matrices on each edge of the four-dimensional grid according to a known probability distribution which describes the theory of D. Okay. And then in the end, we need you know, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 5 of these samples to do any sorts of calculations. So that, that's, the, that's the problem statement. How we normally do this without machine learning um, is, of course, using a Markov chain Monte Carlo type procedure. So you have one of these big samples, and then you turb it a little bit, in this case through HMC, so Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo, which is a coupled walk in position and momentum space through Hamiltonian dynamics to give you a very efficient way of sampling this very high dimensional space. So you evolve a bit with Hamiltonian dynamics, evolve a bit more, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and what that means is that by construction, your samples come in a chain and they're correlated, right? Because you're making a small change from one to the next to the next. Unfortunately, because the algorithm is close to local or diffusive, you can think about the updates propagating out across, across the lattice like this. What that means is that as you make the lattice spacing small, which is of course a limit we have to take um, to get back to continuum physics, the number of updates you need to change physics on a physical scale, like the size of a nucleus, is bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you have a coarse scale, maybe only a couple of updates get you there. If you have a very fine scale, you need many, 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 many updates to decorrelate your samples. This is a manifestation of critical slowing down um, in this context, and it means that finer and finer calculations get more and more expensive and then you know, eventually untractable. So this is the problem we need to solve um, to get really high precision calculations at fine lattice spacings that we need for nuclear physics. So if we forget for a moment our configurations have matrices on each link and just picture them like this, we have a very concrete view of this sampling problem, right? You want to generate this set of samples, the known probability distribution, and then there's this physics in there. What, what happens is that we want to generate samples like this, which as you can see, have sort of correlations on some physical scale, much more frequently than this random noise configuration. So this is the, this is the sampling problem. And of course, there's also an immediate parallel to a problem that you've seen a lot in the machine learning community when we picture it like this, which is the image generation problem. And so there's immediate thought, if you can use AI algorithm, generate these fake pictures of people's faces and get these faces and not that the noise. Maybe you can use the same algorithm to get these configurations, which are very likely and we want to sample lots of, and not this, which is just noise, right? That sort of intuition for why you might want to use machine learning. Of course, there's immediately a big difference here. And that is you never, never, never want this. If you're generating pictures of faces, you, you do want this. and You want it with a very precise probability, right? Uh, and, and if we stack up and make the make the complete comparison of a set or ensemble of gauge fields that we want to generate, some benchmark image set, you see lots of other differences. So the first is the one we already talked about. It's only the ensemble, the set that has any meaning at all. It has to follow a probability distribution. Whereas a picture is a good picture of a face or a dog just on its own merits, right? Then we have an extreme inversion of this data hierarchy. So each sample is described by something like 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 real numbers, and we want thousands or tens of thousands of these samples but this ratio here is completely inverted if you look at a benchmark image set for training machine learning algorithms which image is described by a number of numbers and you have typically way more than that in terms of number of samples to train your algorithm so from this nothing that needs training data is going to work for our problems right we need algorithms that do not rely on having samples from the distribution already if we had them we wouldn't be trying to generate them we'd just do our calculations on okay then some other interesting differences. So it's really the long distance correlations that describe the physics. Um, and a lot of the advances in machine learning for things like images are based on the particular properties of images, like local structures being very important. An eye or a nose in a face is sort of its own structure. For us, it's the long distance. So things like convolutional neural networks don't necessarily apply to our case in the same way. We have a lot of symmetries that of course you don't have um, in images. So here's one. Um, we have symmetries like rotations and translations with periodic boundary conditions in four dimensions. So these things, if their field configurations are the same, right? They need to be generated with exactly the same probability because this is a symmetry relating. Those images, they look quite different. And of course our symmetries get much more interesting than that. Um, what we have is really symmetries under gauge transformations. So remember each edge is actually a matrix and there's a symmetry under a gauge transformation, which is 
left and right multiplication of every matrix here by different matrices, but in a correlated way across the lattice. So what that takes you from is something that would say if every link is the same, under a gauge transformation, now every link looks different. But these are still identical and encode the same physics and need to be generated with exactly the same probability, right? So complicated symmetries. And so Jesse, our host, is of course the director of our new NSF AI Institute, Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And I'm just going to pitch here that these sorts of problems where you know, machine learning might apply, but you have all of these custom physics properties that you need to build in. This is what we're calling ab initio AI. So really putting the physics in from the ground up and designing machine learning algorithms for physics problems, rather than trying to take a machine learning algorithm and you know, shoehorn your physics problem into it. That's, that's really the focus of our institute. Okay, so let's talk about one way of trying to solve this sampling problem, accelerated through AI. Um, and there's, there's lots of approaches. Here's one. Um, it's, it's really very simple conceptually is to do a change of variables. And of course, if we just think about this sort of at the big picture, if you have a really easily sampled distribution, just think uncorrelated Gaussians, that's trivial to sample, very cheap. If you have a map that takes you from that really easy distribution to the distribution you really want, that map's perfect, well, you've completely solved your sampling problem, right? You just take the easy Gaussians, you put them through your map and out come the samples you want. Okay. So, before we think about exactness, let's just think about this problem. This really defines a nice machine learning problem for us. If we can write down this map as a function with a lot of free parameters to be optimized, optimizing those parameters to make this map as close to this trivializing map, this, this map that takes you from the really easy trivial distribution to the one you want as possible, that's your machine learning task. If moreover, this function is, is defined in such a way that it's invertible and has a tractable Jacobian, and you can fix up any inexactnesses in your map through known methods like reweighting or, or, or Metropolis Hastings except reject steps. But then you have a machine learning problem where you can correct for the machine learning being bad and still have exact sample. But of course, let's put lots of requirements on this map. This has to be invertible with a tractable Jacobian, which means it really restricts how we can define this architecture. We also don't have samples from our distribution. But luckily, a map like this can be trained with no samples from our target distribution at all. You can just draw a sample here from your prior, from the easy distribution, you can pop it, pop it through. You can say, what probability should this have been generated with? And what probability was it generated with? And minimize the difference, right? So you don't need training data. You can make your method exact. <clears throat> then you want to build this function to be as expressive as general as possible so you can train it or you can optimize it to give you as close to this trivializing map as you need while still being invertible with the tractable Jacobian. Um, and the way to do that is to build it through the composition of many, many simpler functions um, with very specific properties. So this is the general um, problem setup. Um, these sorts of flow models have been used in the machine learning literature, but, but we need to define our own class of these flow models for our problem. So the very first problem that we come to is in, in most of the machine learning community, these sorts of algorithms are defined to map between real numbers, numbers living on the real line. We have the SU3 matrices on the links. Those live on compact connected manifolds. That's immediately quite a different um, geometry of the problem. Then you have to go, take a step back and say, well, okay, how do I define a machine learning algorithm? Not to map between numbers on the real line, to map between numbers on compact connected manifolds. And the simplest example is, of course, a circle. I want to define a machine learning algorithm that can transform this distribution on the circle to a different distribution on the circle without hitting any numerical instabilities, problems at your endpoint if you try to just take an algorithm for the real line and wrap it around. Um, so you really need to design these from the drawing board. And what you really need, and so I'm sort of intentionally wanting to break down the machine learning into just the maths here. What you mean by this map is just diffeomorphism, that's an isomorphism of smooth manifolds. That's an invertible function. That maps one differentiable manifold to another in such a way that the function and its inverse are smooth. That's all you need, right? So there's some list of properties you can write down that give you that. And so instead of taking, say, a neural network, which is, you know, products of matrix multiplications and some nonlinear functions inserted, you just need to write down a function with some free parameters that satisfies the fact that this is a diffeomorphism, a smooth map with the properties we need. Said, right? And then training those free parameters will be like training the parameters in your neural network. It's just a, a structured neural network, if you like. 
And there's lots of ways you can do this. And so yeah. we don't need to think about traditional machine learning. We just need to write down maps, have a number on the circle, Ed, and I can map it to some number h omega parameterized by omega by drawing this line here. It's called a Mobius transformation. Map from one number on the circle to another. Omega is a parameter that I could optimize. That would be the free parameter in my neural network. Here's another map. This is a spline, just a, a rational quadratic. And, or you can do, you can write down this function. That's a non-compact projection. Project with the real line and back, but you need to be really careful with instabilities at the endpoint and basically tailor expand around the endpoint. You, you can write down all sorts of things and they're all fine as long as they obey these mathematical properties. And they all have free parameters here. You can try to optimize or track, okay? That's the first part. How do you even define a function to operate on the space you're living in? Then there's all the symmetries. So one thing that's, that's really important here is that it's not actually critical for exactness to build in the symmetry. We had to create a scenario where we have a correction step. If the map's bad, you can still correct through reweighting or accept reject. So that also corrects for the symmetries not being exact. But if you have such a high dimensional symmetry group we have here, it's completely impractical to try to mock up this flak direction here. That, that takes a lot of degrees of freedom, a lot of training to just to try to reproduce the fact that you have a flat direction in your graphic space. So in fact, it's, it's not just an advantage to try to build in, but it's absolutely critical for making this work at all. You have to define functions that already have these flat directions with your high dimensional symmetries built in exactly. Um, so that, that brings us to, I, I put this in because we had a nice talk in the machine learning workshop about equivariant neural networks. And this is sort of an example of an equivariant neural network. You want to define a flow to this sampling function that's invariant under your symmetries. And you can do that straightforwardly if the prior is symmetric and then each layer that you build your complicated function out of is equivariant. That just means the symmetry commutes through. Then what you have be a symmetric sampler that generates, you know, the cats, whether all the cats are the same and the cats will cats are different with exactly the same probability just by construction. Okay, so again, what does this symmetry look like? Uh, I'm going to show just a really simple example because I, I don't want to get into too much technical detail. Let's look at an example where instead of a matrix on each link, we just have a complex number on the circle. So yeah, this is now just a complex number on the unit circle. I want to build a sampling algorithm that's equivariant under these sorts of transformations. I'm going to left multiply this complex number and right multiply by different complex numbers like this. And, and that's it. So just the very, very simplest way of doing this, and there's a whole class of ways you can do this, but this is just the very simplest way. Is this is the complex number I want to transform. This has a really complicated transformation. It's going to be left and right multiplied by different numbers. I can compose it like this into something with a simpler transformation property, multiplying by all of the links around the square. Now this object only has to be invariant under left and right multiplication by a number and its conjugate. And because this is an abelian group, everything is invariant under that transformation. This now has a very, very simple transformation property. I can transform this product object any way I like. That's just a number on the circle. That means any of the types of functions I defined before that transform one number on the circle to another number on the circle. Okay. That gives me now a transformed P, this is P, this product goes to P prime. I can sort of product it back onto you and get back my updated link. So I've just defined sort of a, a complicated step where I go via this product of links and then undo it again. This now gives me a function that's a, a equivariant under the symmetry transformation. So, that looks like I showed how to transform just this link here. So you need to transform all of the links across the whole lattice. So you transform some set of links here, you transform some of them, and that's all the layers of this complicated function. You build that up to have a very general function that transforms everything across the whole lattice, but in the symmetry equivariant. This is just a cartoon of how information propagates from one layer to the next, to the next in the, in the lattice. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show a sort of scary slide now. Um, this is just showing how much more complicated it gets when what you care about is not a really, really simple group like E1, just a complex number, but a, a non-abelian group like SD3. The ideas are the same, um, but what I want to emphasize is that it all just boils down to writing down the maths that gives you the type of function you need. What, I showed in, in, what I'm showing here in gray, exactly the part I talked about for U1, 
or an SUN matrix gets a little bit more complicated, you need to actually step fire an eigen decomposition to every matrix. What it turns out is that an equivariant transformation looks like a transformation of the eigenvalues of your matrices in such a way that it's permutation equivariant, but leaves all the um, eigenvectors untouched. So you decompose into eigenvalues, you transform the eigenvalues, you put them back together with the eigenvectors and you undo it. That's happening in every layer of this complicated um, neural network, if you like. Okay, so to be, you know, completely concrete, what the whole thing looks like stepping back then, you take something really easy, you just take a uniform on each link of the lattice, then you build this complicated function that has all of the symmetries baked in. So in this example that I'll show you some numbers for, you have say 24 different layers. In those layers, you're transforming these, these P objects, the products around the links, through say non-compact projections. That's one of the examples for transforming a, a circular variable that I gave you. You can make those transformations very complicated, you can um, change the parameters of those non concat projections through neural networks, giving you how those parameters change. And there's no restrictions on those neural networks and it's just a complicated way of changing the parameters. Um, you just optimize this thing. And then you have a sample that you can make exact. Okay, so part of the motivation of going into a little bit of technical detail here was really just to communicate the fact that it can be really hard to um, create ways of using machine learning to accelerate your algorithms that are um, provably exact. It, 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 we're really in an era now where machine learning is going beyond. I need to use those neural network constructions that have already been defined, like fully connected or convolutional or particular autoregressive architectures. It really now have the technology to optimize complicated functions with many free parameters. And those complicated functions don't have to come from matrix multiplications. They could come from eigen decompositions and recompositions and you know, the whole mess, but have a framework for optimizing all of the free parameters with that, which can give you really useful um, physics results. So here's just an example for this particular application that I showed you with a U1 field theory. Um, this is a measure of the cost of generating each independent sample. On the horizontal axis, we have the parameter of the theory. Going from left to right, we're moving towards the lattice space and getting small. There's this critical slowdown. And the blue and the gray are conventional sampling approaches. Um, this one is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. This is a heat bath algorithm that works for this particular case. You can see that things get exponentially more expensive. We go in this direction. And the machine learning sampling algorithm stays reasonably flat. It goes up a little bit in cost. It's because it gets harder to train. Of course, you're limited by how efficiently you can train your algorithm. Um, but so orders of magnitude faster sampling. So that's the example I went through a little bit of detail because I think it's the easiest one to get a bit of a, a feel for. But of course, there's lots of other challenges if you want to go to actually studying QCD. It's not just how do you deal with compact connecting manifolds? How do you put in your symmetries? Lots of other problems too. There's um, how do you deal with multimodal distributions? And this is an example where this, this flow model it's, it's mathematically guaranteed to be exact in principle, right? In the limit of an infinite number of samples. So how do you go from an in principle guarantee of exactness to an in practice guarantee of exactness? Especially when you have, this is not a particularly pathological example, but what if you have lots of ultra-like modes, lots of different distinct modes? How can you guarantee that you're sampling into all of them? Not just in the limit of infinite statistics, but a finite statistic. So this is, I go to practical tools, we have you know, all sorts of problems with fermions. So in, in QCD, that's the quarks. They're fermionic. They're represented by grass manian variables. Those are anti-commuting variables. So that brings in all sorts of exciting complications that I'd love to talk to you offline. Um, I won't talk about in the colloquium, but essentially um, the way we deal with these is to introduce auxiliary variables into our, into our formulation, but then have to be marginalized over. And they have all of their own interesting symmetries, like anti-periodic boundary conditions in the time direction only. So you have to design an architecture that doesn't just have the gauge symmetries, but couples auxiliary variables that you can efficiently marginalize over and puts in all of the symmetry. So this is its own complication. I'll show you an example of, of the result. But this is some, some expectation value. It doesn't matter what, what it is really. In this case, it's the chiral condensate, but some observable. And on the horizontal axis, we have the number of samples we're taking in our calculation in our Monte Carlo integral. This is what you get if you use a conventional sampling algorithm like hybrid Monte Carlo. This is the truth. So 
it doesn't look good, right? Uh, the, the uncertainties are going down like square root n exactly as, as they should. The number's completely wrong. And, and the reason for that is that um, you're getting stuck in a topological sector. And, and the algorithm, since it's an update-based algorithm, is not able to get over the potential barriers in a finite number of statistics. If you push this out, the many orders of magnitude more samples, you'll eventually see this come down to the true value. But because this is a serial algorithm, you can't get many orders of magnitude more samples. You have to wait for a really long time. You can't parallelize it across a machine. On the other hand, the flow-based sampling algorithm is embarrassingly parallel. So firstly, you can get many orders of magnitude samples much more efficiently by using more machines, but you can also see it converges to the true value immediately. And that's because you're sampling into all topological sectors simultaneously, because it is not an update-based approach. So to really do nuclear physics, which is of course what I motivated this by, there's still a few steps that we have to make. Um, and really this step here, all the theory parts in place, but the scaling um, is, is a huge challenge. So to put this in perspective, traditional algorithms that we use have been optimized over the last 30 years in conjunction with people at NVIDIA, Intel, as each new generation of hardware comes out. And now we need to take these custom machine learning architectures and deploy them on, you know, the first exascale computers with their specific hardware specifications. And so this is really um, model parallelism at the really deep extreme scale. You know, the, the biggest neural networks in industry are using something like 175 billion parameters for natural language processing models. We're talking about optimizing the same scale of algorithm, but for open science, and then optimizing that to run on you know, DOE's, DOE's flagship computing resources. So this is, massive engineering challenge as well as the in, you know, the physics challenge of how do you design the architectures to start with that's what we're working on um, aurora here is is an early we have an early science project on aurora which will be next biggest supercomputer in the us and so we're hoping to deploy our algorithms as soon as that turns on early science period there's a lot of a lot of work in the background to do before we can work okay so what does this give us so let, let's just take stock of where we've gone here we have a provably exact machine learning accelerated sampling algorithm. So if you don't train this at all, you'll still get the right answers. It'll just, you have really big error bars, be really noisy. Uh, you'll have to take very many samples. If you have well-trained machine learning, it can be much, much, much more efficient than traditional. So we saw orders of magnitude more efficient than conventional sampling algorithm. In particular, we've shown that you can overcome these problems of critical slowing down getting stuck in a topological sector to really limiting some of our forefront lattice QCD calculations. We also saw we have unbiased results in, in regions of parameter space where traditional algorithms just fail. Um, so this is all very promising. We need to deploy for state-of-the-art QCD, really have the physics impact we want to have. Coming back to, well, what are those physics impacts? I sort of gave you some hints at the start. So we talked about mu one g minus two, there being an interesting tension between theory and experiment. One of the key pieces of the theory part there comes from lattice QCD calculations. And those lattice QCD calculations are limited by how fine we can get the lattice spacing. So we need to be able to really overcome this critical slowing down, get higher precision G minus two. Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, LHCB experiment finding that new state. There's lots of interesting anomalies in, in B physics at the LHC. Again, lattice QCD calculation to the relevant form factors. Our lattice spacings need improved algorithm. And then, you know, controlled calculations of nuclei, even just for light nuclei up to say 10 would give us such a new approach to first principles nuclear physics. So dark matter direct detection was one example, but we have no other way of getting that information about nuclear structure than trying to do calculation. You can't measure those scalar matrix elements. Um, nuclear reactions, we've done the first step of the big bang nuclear synthesis pathway with big errors. We'd like to do you know, more of the pathway from first principles. So that's hopefully where we're going. And of course, I just want to hint that we've still got a long way to go before these algorithms can get us to these physics goals. But it's been sort of fun to see that it's actually interdisciplinary applications that at least I didn't necessarily expect. So these flows on compact connected manifolds, something else that's defined on a compact connected manifold is the positions of joints of a multi-jointed robot arm. They're of course circular variables. And so you can use these sorts of algorithms actually for other applications too. Okay, so let's just, Again, uh, take stock of the story we've seen. So I, I've talked about how we're getting really new insights into proton structure and nuclear structure through first principles calculations of the standard model. And one particular place where we have a, a lot of potential is in setting standard model benchmarks 
beyond standard model physics searches, especially if we can really ground nuclear physics in this, in this way. And secondly, to try to reach beyond those frontiers, we, we really need new algorithms because the ones we have scale exponentially and factorially badly. Machine learning is one potential avenue, but we have to be very, very careful because we need provably exact machine learning that has to be developed from the ground up for our physics problems. Um, otherwise, there's just no way of doing it at this scale. So that's hopefully going to enable previously intractable calculation and change the scope of first principles of physics. Thank you. Back. So, uh, when, when the T minus two experimental results came out last year, there were uh, interesting differences between different lattice QCD calculations. At least some groups were claiming that there were significant differences. So, A, have those been resolved, or B, do you think these kinds of methods will resolve them? Yeah, so the, there's one group that has, if you take just their pure lattice QCD calculations, sort of in between. With your in experimental results that's from the bmw collaboration um, and that's a case where they've been able to do every part of you know the particular hadronic contributions within their own framework in a consistent way the other groups are still doing that you know the the theory calculation there comes from the g minus two theory initiative which is then an average over all of the different community theory efforts and some parts of that are actually taken from dispersive approaches not from lattice qcd um, so there there are some interesting tensions say a lot of groups should get results at the similar level as of precision as the bmw results within the next year ish so if there's still a tension there that'll be really interesting to resolve one thing that it could be is from these fine other spacing it's really hard to control your systematic artifacts and then yeah better algorithms that help you get down to final lattices will help but hopefully it's just something in the analysis between the different groups hi i had a related question uh, that particular group had only 1.5 sigma difference uh, from the you know between the experimental and uh, what they predict. Um, in order for you to uh, either get to their accuracies, uh, will these machine learning algorithms uh, help you to get there, the, to control the systematics and so on? So, if we can deploy this at scale, which as I said, big engineering challenge, not clear if we can really get models for open science at the scale of the biggest ones used in industry soon um, then yeah one thing that it can give you is to get better control on one of the big systematics which is the extrapolation to zero lattice spacing um, and so the way these calculations work is you don't just do one calculation you do a calculation at this lattice spacing and this spacing and this spacing and this spacing and this box size and this box size and this box size and then you have to extrapolate um in that whole space and yeah. so of course if you get closer to the final lattice spacing you have a smaller error and a smaller systematic uncertainty on those extrapolations. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, I'm from the gravitational wave area. Uh, the numerical relativity simulations ex exploit this kind of uh, accuracy requirements. I had a related question with, with regard to this. Uh, uh, you know, you don't need any training for these neural networks to work. You need training, but no training data. Yeah, no training at all. Is it? Training, yes, yeah. no training data. Yeah, so what what are the requirements that there is no training here? I mean, under what circumstances would that work? I'm asking this question because we really have a hard time training the algorithms. Uh, every time there is a new run from LIGO, we need to rerun, you know? I, how, how does that work? What, what are the conditions? When does it work? So. In our case, it works because we can compute the likelihood for each sample from our theory. So that's that's a property of, of the theory we're studying, that you can compute that up to normalization. And then we design an algorithm that you can compute the likelihood from the algorithm. So that's an algorithmic choice. And because we have those two things, you can then compare the likelihood that you got with the likelihood you should have got without ever having training data. And then you, then you have something to optimize, right? If, if you can't compute the likelihood from your theory, maybe all you have is a set of samples from the distribution and then you can't do it. If you can compute the likelihood, then you can. So at every point you have an analytical approach to computing the likelihood. Okay. That's right. It's just function that we can compute up to the normalization, but you can get around the normalization. Right, okay. 
there any particular aspects of the ML model? I mean, you're using a diffusion model and iterative. Like, are there any aspects of that that are slower than you like? Um, so our machine learning model is is just this flow to sample from, right? There's no chain, there's no iterative process. It's just the model. Um, as for the bits that are slower than we like, yeah, I mean, we had to do some really low level optimization on eigenvalues for three by three matrices, you know, <laughs> hard coding those on GPUs, not on CPUs. You know, when you profile the machine learning models, you'll find that suddenly because of an update somewhere, some tiny part has got pushed to the CPU. Um, and then that's a real, it, it might just be like a sort or something suddenly changed from one version to the next and got pushed to the CPU. So th those are usually the types of things that are a problem. And all of our custom components, we have these custom four dimensional convolutions, we have these eigenvalue decompositions, and none of those are things that are typically optimized at the low. So, so we're trying to optimize them at the low level, but the, those are all the bottlenecks, yeah. Hi. Um, I was very excited to hear about your first Ooh, first principles calculations about DEM. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're finding so far? And um... yeah, so I mean, really, it was for for the BBN. It is exactly what that plot showed, and and that's it. We're trying to get better systematic control. That's the 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 nuclear effects is what we're really targeting. So how different is that cross section? From what you get from just the proton and neutron interactions with the photon on their own what's the two body attribution um so that's what let me see if i can bring that that's what that figure is showing um rather than try to go to the next step of the bbn pathway so far what we've done is looked at some other simple nuclear actions so proton proton fusion is another one we've done in recent years um, and so the idea is, I mean, this one, of course, there is that experimental value there. This is really the cross check for us. This is the, can we do nuclear physics? Does this extrapolation work? Do we believe it? And then the goal is to go to some things where there's not experimental results there. We have one other questions online and then come back to Yudai. Oh yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is Yudai. Thanks for the great talk. So I know that people are developing this nuclear clock and they have to require a very uh, complicated theory calculation. So I wonder if um, and these nuclear clock are used to detect dark matter or fundamental constant change. So I wonder if there's an application there that we can apply the initial AI to that kind of calculation. Thanks. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about the theory calculations, the nuclear clocks answer. Um, I mean, from the this specific set of, of AI tools, any calculation that you want to do within a framework of a lattice field theory doesn't have to be QCD. Um, could, could be you know, even a nuclear effective theory um, can use these types of tools to accelerate. If you can frame it in this language, this works. Uh, you can also, I mean, this particular thing that I was talking about is, is really just a sampling algorithm. So if you have the same sort of framework where you have a tractable likelihood, you can apply this sort of an approach. But the question there is just whether, it, whether your problem is um, sort of has the same hierarchies of cost. Right. This, this works for us because computing the likelihood is fairly cheap compared mm. to generating more samples. If computing the likelihood is really, if that's the bottleneck, probably this sort of an approach isn't going to help you beat that because you still have to compute the likelihood at every stage. But if the problem can be framed in the same way, yeah. they apply. I see. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We have a question from, from online, Paul. Thanks. I'm. Uh curious about uh, your choice of this function. I understand you're uh, learning a parameterized function um, to be able to sample from a simple distribution to map the probability distribution of the desired one. But I'm wondering how much trial and error uh, there is. You showed a few examples for um, uh, uh, the U1 gauge theory, but uh, when you're working with the uh, eigenvalues of the SU3 matrices, as you just said, it gets to be a bit more complicated. And of course, if you knew that function exactly, you would know a huge amount about the theory. So I'm just wondering what goes into the choice of that function and how do you know you have a good one? Right, so yeah, that's a really good question. It's, uh, as, as you've guessed, pretty complicated. 
you, you can try to do some things that are more physics motivated than others. So for example, you can try to make that function be essentially a map through temperature space, because you know, say a low temperature limit or a high temperature limit. So you can try to force that map to be changing a physical property of your theory. Um, or you can try to force that map to be following geodesic, your high dimensional space. Um, so, so those are, for example, properties of how you optimize, which can cause, you know, that, that's one degree of freedom, how you optimize the map. Then the other degree of freedom, which you were talking about, is how you define the map at all. Um, and for the how you define the map at all, um, it's really a few principles. It's the most general thing you can write down that still has a few very important properties that we want to preserve. So the symmetries, but also um, we want the structure to be hierarchical because we want to be able to apply it multiple different volumes without having to change the function. So you want to define the function in such a way that it applies in many different um, scales. And so that's, again, an example of where the physics comes into the structure, of the architecture. But the, the general fight is the most uh, general, the most flexible parameterization that we can write down um, while still in it, respecting the symmetries. Uh, so coming from the effective field theory side, there's been so much work recently on three body interactions and clenching and all these other things. So what's the prospect for kind of checking this three body interaction effects of lattice? Yeah, so I mean, we, we have done calculation of say helium three. So one of the things you can try to get out of that is you can try to match on to effective field. That's actually something that we've been working on lately is matching um, lattice calculations to effective field theory to pull out, you know, the low energy constants or your your forces, your two body forces, your three body forces. Um, so prospects are really good. Uh, not yet in year of complete control for these calculations though. So at the moment, um, we can, for example, pull out three body interactions. If you live in a world where all the pions are 800 MeV, we can show that the pipeline works by doing it with systematic control is, is mutationally hard. Take some questions and then... Uh... A couple of quick questions. To what extent are simulations done for one problem useful for answering things about a different problem? Uh, do you have any sort of like portability in, in the computations, or is it like start from scratch for each different physical system here? No, no, no. So, um, I mean, this is some the, the sampling is the very first step of the lattice calculation. Then you can use it everything from your nuclear physics calculations to G minus two once you have your set of samples. The set of samples you can then do all the physics on, but not only that, on the set of samples is for say a fixed lattice spacing and a fixed volume, a fixed set of quark masses. What we've found is, I mean, it, it's maybe obvious that the map from the trivial distribution to the distribution with some set of parameters is a really long way, but the map between the distribution for the quark masses being 140 MeV or 150 MeV is a really short way. And so um, the way that this is going to be used is there's going to be one model trained at great expense, exascale hardware, and that model will give you, you know, lots of different quark masses through very tiny amounts of retraining, and it will be hierarchical. So it'll give you lots of different volumes and lots of different lattice spacings all at the same time, um, at, at a small extra cost. So uh, when you're trying to sample for multiple distributions, does the choice of loss function make a difference in whether your Network is exploring unexplored parts or it's like contracting into. Yeah, certainly. So how you optimize, that's the choice of loss function, really matters. And and the, the network, naively, I mean, it has density everywhere. In the limited statistics, you will sample from all of the modes. You can definitely write down you know, loss function that will pathologically push you into a mode. And then you can fool yourself at finite statistics. It's certainly possible to choose a bad loss function. Um, the, the best seems to really be to, to use geodesic based loss function. <coughs> yeah. Well, very short. Yeah. Uh, can you talk the talk with the uh, um, uh, interaction of uh, dark matter with the detector and the uh, yeah, physical prediction and the physical one that goes a bit down? So, yeah. Is it obvious for the scalar that the extrapolator will be lower than the physical, so even farther from zero? Can you put that up instead? Closer. It is. It's. It's. It, it, it's not obvious. It depends on the interplay of your two-body, three-body, four-body type interactions. For helium three, we have sort of maybe a little bit of a handle on the two and three-body pieces. Um, 
oh, yeah. it, it's it's not obvious. And at some level, that that's so big was sort of surprising to start with. That that's a few orders of magnitude bigger than the weak interaction matrix element. So co-intuition doesn't work for that. I don't know how it's going to work for the extrapolation. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Thanks, Elvin.